good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second of our three-part webinar series on spring killers in livestock, presented to you by Northern Tablelands Local Land Services. My name is Tani Mann, and I'm a livestock officer with Northern Tablelands LLS, um, based in Glen Ennis, and servicing the entire Northern Tablelands region. So our topic for this evening's webinar is clostridial diseases in livestock. Just before we get the webinar underway, uh, we'll just go through a little bit of housekeeping. So there should be a control but, uh, panel up in the top right hand corner of your screen. And there is a red arrow button on the left, which collapses and reinstates uh, the control panel. You should hear us, but we can't hear you. Uh, as we go through the presentation tonight, as uh, with our last webinar on bloat, um, please type your questions into the box provided uh, and I will relay to the questions to our panellists throughout the course of the webinar. We're again going to run this webinar uh, in a more relaxed conversational style rather than a formal presentation, so please get those questions through to us. And this webinar is also being recorded, so uh, it will be available to you to um, for your um, future reference in the coming days. There is also a handout, which is a, a prime fact on clostridial diseases in cattle, uh, which you're able to download at any time throughout this presentation. So tonight, um, the panelists joining me are Andrew Biddle. Andrew is a district vet uh, with Northern Tablelands LLS in Inverell. We also have Leanne Paulson. Leanne has just not long started with us and she's a district vet uh, in Armadale. And also, um, should I say, back by popular demand is uh, Nigel Brown, who is our district vet uh, based, in, based in Glen Ennis. So we'll get, we'll get started with the webinar. So Andrew, if I can start with you, um, let's start with what is a clostridial disease? Look, I suppose put simply, um, clostridial diseases are diseases caused by a group of bacteria. Um, clostridia, there's a whole series of, of bacteria in the in the group. The the, the rather uh, pretty pictures there on the on the screen now are are what they look like under a uh, under a microscope. There's a there's a number of them, and the different the different all bacteria produce different toxins which are ultimately the things that cause potentially either pulpy kidney or tetanus or black leg botulism and those diseases that we routinely uh, routinely link with uh, with with clostridia and clostridial um, clostridial vaccination. And and so we think uh, I guess traditionally we think clostridia we think of sheep and cattle but they also occur in other animals don't they Leanne? Yeah, they certainly do. Um, so I believe clostridial diseases have been reported in a, a range of animals and their susceptibility to disease varies widely. Um, so our livestock and horses seem to be quite susceptible to disease, where birds of prey seem to have developed a certain degree of resistance. And that's probably because of their scavenger type lifestyles. So we've got, um, as you can see in the slides, we've got, um, we've got a duck there. Um, so it, it's again, it's not just limited to to sheep and cattle, but also it, you know it does affect other livestock. So Andrew, I, I might go back to you and, and pose a question: What what conditions may cause clostridia? What basically every every clostridial disease and the toxin that that leads to it, there'll, there'll be different um, a different situation that allows that bacteria to increase in numbers and start to produce toxin. If we look brief, if I talk briefly about something like tetanus, you know, the classic um, way that tetanus um, occurs is where you get a, a puncture wound and whether it be a, um, a horse treading on a nail or or the, uh, the person who was uh, pruning the roses prior to antibiotics coming on board, who got, who got the wound, got some soil contamination and then the wound closed over and so you get an environment where there's no where there's no oxygen and the clostridia tetani it likes an anaerobic environment it increases in numbers produces a toxin animal gets animal gets tetanus 
If we move to pulpy kidney, which is probably more topical this time of year and certainly what a lot of people are concerned about, the, the bacteria um, is um, Clostridia perfringens. It's a, no, it's a normal inhabitant, inhabitant of the intestines of, a, um, of cattle, of sheep, and it normally just happily sits in balance with the other with all the other microbes that are in there in a very you know, harmonious, happy sort of a uh, relationship. But when there's a change in something to do with the diet, and that could be, I mean, once again, this year, it's when you get a, 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 flush, of, a flush of feed and it's green and it's rich and it's got lots of plant sugars in there. Some of those plant sugars go from the, from the, from the rumen and the, and, the, and the stomachs through into the intestines. That increase in sugars, is like you know rocket fuel to the bacteria. Bacterial numbers increase. Toxin gets produced, and if the toxin overwhelms vaccination, or if there hasn't been vaccination, those animals are likely to succumb to pulpy kidney or enterotoxemia. So I guess following on from that, how do we know that that it is Clostridia? How how do people identify? It? Leanne, if I can start with you. Yeah, it does require a bit of investigation. So clostridial diseases such as tetanus and botulism usually kill animals over a couple of days and there's different symptoms associated with that. With tetanus, you get a, um, a rigidity of the muscles. Um, so in dogs, they get this weird smiley grin in their ears prick. Um, with cattle, they get stiff gated. Their ears also sort of pin back. Their eyes look like they're bulging out. Um, and with botulism, they get a paralysis or paresis, a weakness that starts in the back legs and it generally moves forward. They'll often get a paralysis in their tongue and be seen drooling and stuff as well. Um, where our other diseases like pulpy kidney, Black's disease, black leg, they're often the ones that we just wake up and find dead. Okay, so, so um, what about the Nigel, if I can direct this question to you, what are the other things that it, that it might be apart from, apart from Clostridia? Well, at this time of year, you, you're right. Anything that's going to cause sudden death um, is, is is up there. So we're looking at things like hypermagnesemia, bloat, um, would be top of our lists at the moment of this sort of thing. Um, but as as Leanne says, that it, it's the investigation that's needed, and and anybody can pluck a name off the list of things they've heard of and say, oh, this animal died of that. But the, the big thing is to have a look at them. Do a post mortem. I mean, you've got this beastie here lying dead on its side. It would be relatively easy to open that one up, have a little look, see whether where the focus of problems are. Is it in the gut? Is it in the lungs? That one from from here doesn't look to be too uh, decomposed because, as Andrew said, they, these organisms are everywhere, and we saw that first little picture with all the spores that are in that are in the end of the organism and when you get those changing conditions whether it's that's the spores whether it's the changing condition from a bruise like let allows in the tetanus or the changing gut condition those spores rapidly multiply now we can't see those but we can see the changes that come a lot of these most of these clostridia using a toxin can't see the toxin. So it's a question of looking to see where the focus of problems are. So to then you can diagnose whether it's 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 bloat that's caused it with a buildup of pressure or whether it's a, an active infection of some sort or enteritis or indeed we, we've all done post mortems where you pick out the kidneys and they trickle between your fingers. That's why it's called pulpy kidney. But not always, because there's other forms of it, and they trickle through there, no doubt about it. And uh, you're speaking from experience here, Lionel, I, I think it. I am. We used to get a lot of pulpy kidney in lambs in England, where the lamb would not be, would only just have died, I mean, they have to be dead to do a post-mortem, but you, you, they're only just dead, and the, 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 the kidneys are trickling between your fingers. So, so there are obviously some things that, that it can be apart from apart from clostridia. Yep. Um, so yeah, don't don't always assume, but it, it, it's a good idea to if you do have one die, you know, unexpectedly to, to get a postmortem to yep. to do some further investigations. Absolutely, absolutely. So so now we, we've sort of talked about you know clostridia, um, you know, 
So how do we identify it? What are some of those things that we can do to, to prevent clots through there? Andrew, if I can start with you. I mean, look, it's a, uh, I suppose it's very, it's very simple. You know, it, it's, it's, it's effective vaccination and, and maintaining a effective uh, level of vaccination. So, you know, if, if we start from the, start from the beginning, you know, vaccination requires two, two doses, four to six weeks apart. So you, the first, when, you, when you're vaccinating, the, you know, we should all know about vaccination now, we're following it on television every day in the context of COVID and we all know the, the state and national LGA levels of, of vaccination for COVID and it's a, it's a two shot vaccination and it's the same with, with, uh, you know, with five in one, six in one, seven in one, eight in one. The first vaccination that you give introduces the immune system to to the vaccine and the and, and the and the immune system starts to I suppose hardwire itself to uh, to the uh, I suppose when the when the organism or when the toxin comes along. When that second vaccination occurs, when you look at that 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 uh that graphic on there at the moment, you get that rapid increase in um in antibody levels because because of that initial introduction of with the first vaccination, when the second one comes along, you get that that rapid rise, and that's what then continues along as a uh, as as a level of protection. But I think it's important to look at that that gradient that's on that graph going going down because over time that's going to continue to drop, and there's a point on that y-axis where the level of protection is potentially below the amount of um, yeah the amount of toxin that that the animals are actually being exposed to, and when that ends up the wrong way round, your animals become susceptible to to uh, yeah to pulpy kidney to tetanus to to one of those uh, one of those you know five diseases because that happens. So two vaccinations four to six weeks apart, and I think one of the keys to to effective vaccination is knowing how long it is required before before you give a a booster vaccination. And one of the things, yeah, you know, one of the keys to, that we should all think about with with treating our livestock, whether it be with vaccines or drenches or antibiotics or anything else, is before you start, you should always read the label because one of the things that you'll find on the label when you, you know for five in one is it'll tell you how frequently animals need to be revaccinated and one of the key things particularly with pulpy kidney is you actually don't get 12 months protection from those two shots four to six weeks apart you need to vaccinate more frequently to maintain that higher level of immunity so that the immunity stays above the level blood level where the um, where the disease can occur antibody antibody levels high disease levels are lower everything's happy if it gets the other way around, that's when you start to risk losing animals. Yeah, and that, that's really important uh, point that you do do mention, Andrew, about, um, you know, it's not just um, two, two shots and you get 12 months immunity. Nigel, would you like to comment any further on, on um, that, that effective protection? Look, I think, I think Andrew makes the point very, very well. Um, I personally, around here, around Glen, I tend to be thinking that you've got high risk times. So when the when you're changing animals onto a, a a richer food, that's a high risk time. When the grass is hopefully going to grow and you're going to get springtime growth, that's a high risk time. And the lag between giving a booster and a and a rise of the antibody levels, I tend to think of as being 10 to 14 days. So you've got to try and anticipate and get it in. And if you look at the, the, the costs involved, there's far more costs involved in the time to get the animals into the yards to vaccinate them than there ever is in vax, the cost of the vaccines. And, and, and Andrew and Paul Pulliam will, will chat through the different vaccines available. But the cost of those vaccines is minimal. So it makes every sense 
to get those vaccines whenever you anticipate. And if you can dovetail it in with your routine weighing to see how they're growing, et cetera, et cetera. It makes every sense to just add, add, add a few cents, as it were, to the cost and, and get some more vaccines. It, it, it really is cheap insurance, isn't oh, it? Absolutely. Yeah, so, so I guess following on from that, we're talking about vaccines and, and you know, most people will, um, you know, give a five in one for that uh, effective protection against against clostridials. But um, we have a, a range of others. So we have five, six, seven, eight in one. So if we can just talk through the differences between those, Leanne, if I can start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so there are a range of vaccines on the market. And um, I do suggest that people do their homework and sort of find one that best suits their enterprise. Um, so the five in one's the basic one, I'd say just kind of does the core um, clostridials that, that we've been talking about tonight. Um, the six in one um, covers cheesy gland as well for the sheep producers out there. The seven in one uh, also does leptospirosis. Um, the eight in one, it does eight clostridial diseases um, and helps prevent uh, lamb dysentery and um, postpartum gangrene in ewes. Um, which is caused by other types of clostridial diseases. Yeah, so, so it's important to, like you say, Leanne, do your homework uh, when you're going out to, to get those vaccines and, and make sure you're getting um, the vaccine that is right for, for your enterprise and, and for, your, for your production system. Yeah, so and there's, a, there's a separate, so, sorry, Tony, yeah, there's a separate um, botulism vaccine available as well. Um, but I guess a lot of a lot of producers are careful about what feed they uh, allow their cattle or sheep to have access to. So silage that's well made and it's been made at an appropriate pH, because um, that'll kill off a lot of the bacteria that cause these diseases. Um, and yeah, avoiding um, access to carcasses and things where they're likely to pick up botulism. Yeah, and that's a really good point, Leanne, because because botulism, even though it's a clostridial disease, is not covered in those you know, five, six, seven, eight, eight in one. So then it's actually a separate separate vaccination that, that people, if you're wanting to, to vaccinate your animals against botulism, it is a separate one that you do need to need to go and buy. Yeah. So while we're talking vaccinations, um, where where do people inject an animal and, and why is that important, Andrew? Look, um, just before I move on to that, there's a, just a couple of points I thought I'd make. You can't overdose an animal with vaccine. So if we're looking at frequency of vaccination and you know, Nigel rightly pointed out that, you know, if you bring them through the yards for some other reason, give them another dose of five in one. The other thing is there's no withhold period on five in one vaccine. So you're not having to think about, oh, you know, is it 30 days, is it 40 days, is it 120 days before I can sell them? So it's, you're not gonna do them any harm. I, um, a very wise person once, once said to me, the only way you can kill an animal with five in one is to choke them on the packaging. So you're not gonna do it by injecting them. So that's just a couple of points I'd like to make there. When you're looking at, at where, to, um, where to vaccinate the animal, once again, read the, uh, read the, 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 the instructions that come, that come with the packaging because yeah, the first thing is it's a, um, it's a subcutaneous injection, subcutaneous under the skin. It's not into the muscle, it's under the skin. So that the, the key is to have a needle that's long enough to get under the skin of the animal, sharp enough to go through the skin, but you don't want to be driving it into the muscle area. And on that graphic there of, the, of those, those two cattle beasts, yeah, there's very much a looking at, a, uh, at an area in the, in the, um, in the neck and, and not in the, uh, in, in the yeah, in the in the back half of the carcass, and one of the reasons for that is that yeah, you know, there's it's quite easy to to get to those areas to vaccinate. They're also the the cheap cuts, I suppose, for want of a better word. You know, yeah, you know, we all know that you get lumps with uh, with vaccination, and look, yeah, you know, lumps just yeah. You know, if you see animals with lumps, you know they're being vaccinated. It's not a bad thing. It's actually demonstrating that the animal's immune system has actually been to where that vaccination was given and it's actually doing what's meant to happen. So it isn't a, you know, getting lumps when you vaccinate is just a part of the process. So if you're gonna get lumps, have them 
in the uh, in the areas where you know the most expensive uh, cuts of um, of beef aren't actually occurring. I suppose one other thing I'd say with vaccination, whilst it's it's critically important for the health of the animals, when you're looking at how you're going to vaccinate your animals and you know whether you're going to vaccinate high on the neck or low on the neck, it's still really important to consider your own safety. You know, don't be don't be reaching through over or under rails where an animal's potentially going to jump sideways and and injure you. Either if if that's something you're concerned about, you either need to to modify your approach or you know just look at how you know at your at your stock handling facilities to make it to make it safer because you know although animals are incredibly valuable at the moment, I like to think all of us are just a little bit more valuable than the animals that are in our paddocks. So always consider your safety. And you know, in in these cases here you can see where the the animal is is having the, the skin lifted, sort of getting that tent area under the skin, and then the needles going into that space that's been that's been created by lifting the skin to provide a spot for that um for that inject for that for the five in one and reduces the likelihood of it going straight through and out the other side. Uh, Nigel, would you like to um, yeah, um, yeah, further on that? Yes, I would. I, I brought along a, 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 just an automatic, let me get it in the camera, um, a, a sort of a small syringe. And I just deliberately put on a needle, an inch needle that I see a lot of people using. Now, if you go in at right angles, you're going to go through the skin, probably through a layer of fat and hit the muscle. You, for really for sheep, you want a, a needle that's probably only a, a quarter of an inch, so a, a half, half to one centimetre long and possibly double that for cattle. And, and you don't go in at right angles, you go in at an angle to get it to get it in the right place. Andrew's spot on there. And nowadays with health and safety, we, we try and avoid putting your hand in the in the way to create a tent because that's how you get your st yourself stuck. Um, and while you, it means you don't get tetanus, you get a very sore th finger and, and you can get, uh, you can get, um, you know, other problems associated with it. And, and Andrew and I were having a chat, or several of us were having a chat the other day, and we made a very valid point, I think it was Andrew that said it, that when people have finished their vaccine, they try and save the stuff that's in this bit of tube and in here by squirting it back into the vaccine. Don't, do not do it, because all the muck and filth that's on the needle from however many animals you've been injecting is then put straight back into the, the vaccine and it's just going to fester and foment. And so those people that try and reuse the vaccine later on in the day are just going to be in, injecting an ever increasing cesspit of fluid into their animals. Not recommended. So Nigel, can we just hold that up a little bit closer to the camera so we may be able to see the length of that length of that needle? Let's see if I can. Um, it's all in reverse here. Can you see? So that's a that's a purple one inch needle, uh, and that's that's too long. And I commonly see that happen. And I have seen people with the the purple one and a half inch needle, which is even longer, which is. Oh, I'm covering it there myself, but uh, let's try and find the. You can possibly see that against the white background of the wall. That's your intramuscular injection, and that that's going to go into the muscle for wherever. And and the vaccine just won't work because the the level of blood supply in those places is so different from where it's designed to be. And and there are plenty of research papers now where they've injected blue dye to show where people are injecting. And the blue dye clearly shows it's all in the wrong place. So you, you, you've heard it here first. Um, um, don't use those, those larger needles. Make sure you do get the, the appropriate needles to go with those, those um, you know, automatic injector guns. So, so while we're talking about that, um, Nigel's just touched on, you know, don't don't put that that bit of um, vaccine that's in the tube and in the syringe back into the bottle. What about other, other handling of, of vaccines? That's also pretty important, isn't it? 
Absolutely, yes. Um, if, if you show this next picture, um, that, that's of a local producer just outside Glen Innes who's got a very fancy gadget, which you can possibly see. It's got the vaccine covered in a cooling unit. It's keeping the sunlight away because sunlight will denature vaccine. He's got a holder for his needle, which is strapped, and you can see that tube. So that's a safety sort of unit to be able to, so it allows him to do all the other trenching or whatever he's doing without having it hanging from a bent bit of wire on the roof or the side of the crush, banging against the crush, bending the end of the needle. Uh, all of those things are gonna cause problems. So that's typical. It, 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 there is a, a raft of different mechanisms to do it, but you've got to keep them vaccine cool, uh, at about the same temperature as beer, right? And, and you've got to keep them out of the sunlight and you've got to keep your needles and equipment clean. So that means changing your needles from time to time. But I, I say, Andrew gave us a chat through the other day on a whole raft of those things. Have I missed anything, Andrew? I was just going to point out when you were talking about beer, Nigel, that's Australian beer, not English. Room temperature. <laughs> That That is perfectly correct. I would accept that, and I didn't go down that road because I still prefer English beer. Right, so, so keep it at the temperature of your of your of your good Australian lager. When you go to the uh, you know, when, when you go to where you buy your vaccine, you get it out of the fridge. yeah, you know, just continue that cold chain all the way home into your fridge at home, up to the yards, between races. And uh, yeah, by doing all those things, you maximise the you maximise the the benefit you get from the um, from the time you take and the money you spend to protect those you know, very valuable livestock. Yep. Yeah, and, and look, while we we um, we touched on before about the frequency of, of vaccination in in our livestock, uh, what what if somebody and Leanne, I'll ask you this this question: What if somebody buys? livestock in and they don't know the, the vaccination status of those livestock. What what would you recommend then that people do? Yeah, with livestock coming onto your farm, you're best to assume that they've not been vaccinated before. Give them an initial dose, a booster dose, and then follow that up as required if pulpy kidney is going to be a risk or their annual booster. Um, and it's often recommended if you can with your pregnant females, give them that booster two to six weeks before calving, and then you'll get some immunity, some passive immunity through the colostrum for those calves. And so then they've already got some protection, they're ready for that initial booster, and then they're good to go. And, and I guess, as, and as Andrew touched on, that, that you can't, um, the only way you're gonna kill them is by probably choking them with the, with the packet of five in one. So, so you, can't, you can't overdose them. Nigel, would you like yeah. to comment for that? Look, I was just gonna say, I was ask Leanne, what, what's your perspective, Leanne, on how soon after a calf is born, should you be giving them their first vaccine when you, if you're hanging on to them? So I'd usually recommend that four to six week mark. So they've got some protection on board then when it comes to marking, because you're gonna create some injuries that are gonna let some clostridium in. So you, you've got a higher risk at marking of getting tetanus and things if you haven't already vaccinated those animals. Yep, yep. If I may, I totally agree with you because I, I had a guy a few years back had three mobs of sheep lambing at subtly different times. By the time he got round to marking, the, the first born out of the earliest mob um, was totally susceptible and we had dead, dying, shaking, stiff lambs with tetanus coming in. So totally agree with you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and that, that, that's a really good point on, on actually when to, when to get those vaccines into those younger younger stock. Yeah. So, so we, we sort of, we're getting close to time, but there's, look, there's some people that, that have registered for this webinar that are sort of out of the North, Northern Tablelands area. So, you know, I would say to those, you know, um, for some for some I guess some tailored advice you know please speak to your own district vet or, or livestock officer um, to get some get some advice for your specific region uh, and and to you know to those people that, that are uh, joining us tonight that are in the northern tablelands look please um, 
for, for more specific or tailored information to your enterprise, pl please call either one of the district vets or, or one of the livestock, livestock officers in, in your area and we can certainly have a, have a chat over the phone, we can come out and have a farm visit um, and, and talk to you about, about some, of these, some of these other things. So that, that's going to um, just about wrap us up tonight. Um, I'd like to thank Andrew, Leanne and Nigel very much for your attendance tonight. Um, it, it was great to, to have a chat about Clostridia and, and something that's, that's very important and um, especially considering livestock are worth so much, it's, um, it's pretty cheap insurance to give them, to give them a, a vaccine. So thank you again. Uh, there is a short survey uh, that will pop up once you close the webinar. It'll take a, about 15 seconds or so and we would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, on this webinar and, and you know potential future topics for webinars so if you could um, could fill that out we would greatly appreciate that. Our uh, final webinar in this series uh, on worms is coming up this Thursday night at six o'clock uh, where I will be joined by Nigel Leanne and Andrew again but also Lisa Martin who is our DV up at Tenerfield so if you haven't already registered for that it's not too late so um, please register for that. But uh, otherwise, um, thank you for your attendance tonight. Um, stay safe and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Good night. Bye.